AEW Dynamite on Wednesday had the match between CM Punk and Wardlow. And I talked about this on the stream on Wednesday night because there was a lot of divided opinion about this match. There were people like myself who thought that what they did, you know, largely made sense. It progressed things. It was probably the best outcome that they could have done instead of beating one person clean over the other because I don't think it would have been the right time to... It, I know it wouldn't have been the right time to beat Punk because he should not be losing before he faces MJF. Uh, but the way they did it, I thought, was smart in that they kept Wardlow strong the entire time. It looked like Punk just couldn't figure out how to beat this guy. Wardlow looked dominant for the uh, 98% of the match, I would say. Ended up powerbombing Punk about seven or eight times total throughout the match. Would have had him beat. Had him dead to rights were it not for MJF stopping the count, telling him to do more, punish him some more, powerbomb him on the timekeeper's table outside the ring... You know, if there's one thing I would have changed, I would have probably, when he did that powerbomb, I would have had him get disqualified. I know AEW doesn't like doing DQ finishes. I would have had Wardlow get disqualified for that because you get to the same place where Wardlow can be upset and he can blame MJF for telling him to do that in the first place. So you kind of, you, you see what I mean? You get back to the same place. But beyond that, you know, we, we can say whether it should have been a DQ or, you know, you have Punk do what he did, which was in the end he surprised Wardlow with a very uh, weak, you know, inside cradle and he, he surprised him and so he pinned him. So Wardlow did technically get pinned. But I don't think anybody watching that match would come away from that match thinking, oh boy, you know, Wardlow, boy, he, he was made to look really weak. You know, Wardlow dominated this fucker. Had the match won, and the only reason he didn't win is because of MJF. And when the match was over, the place looked like they were about to just explode in a, in a, in a building where they weren't really all that uh, enthusiastic throughout the night. They weren't a very loud crowd, but they badly wanted to see Wardlow turn against MJF. So they're building two things at once. They're building to a Punk-MJF match, but they're also building to a split between Wardlow and MJF. And I saw some people, I know Lance Storm, even some wrestlers, he was one who thought it was very damaging to CM Punk what they did and, and to people's overall interest in seeing Punk wrestle MJF. I disagree. I, I understand what he's saying. It didn't diminish my interest personally in seeing that match. I want to see both. I want to see Punk and MJF, but I also want to see Wardlow and MJF and what happens next with the two of them. Because as I've said before, Wardlow is going to be a big deal. He's going to be a big baby face in this company. And speaking of Wardlow, WrestleVotes tweeted on Wednesday. This is before the match aired between uh, Punk and Wardlow. WrestleVotes said, With his biggest match to date happening later tonight, I can confirm without hesitation that WWE will be extremely interested in luring Wardlow away from AEW when his contract is due. There are several people within WWE that love his potential. And water is wet and grass is green. Yes, of course, WWE would be stupid not to have interest in Wardlow. You look at the guy, just physically, compared to a lot of the people they have on their roster today, you could see why they would have an interest in him. Wardlow had just done an interview with PW Insider and talked about wanting to be an AEW lifer. So the timing of this is very interesting. He said, in 10 or 20 years, I'm going to be so excited and proud to look back and say that I was one of the AEW originals that means so much to me because my career started. You know, obviously I did some indies, but the world didn't know me. As far as the world knows, my career started with AEW, and it's going to end with AEW. And I look forward to accomplishing and growing as much as humanly possible and reaching the stars throughout the next 10 years. And he goes on to talk, you know, he credits Tony Khan and Omega and Cody and the Bucks and all, all the founding fathers of AEW for... You know, giving him the opportunity and treating him like gold. He said, I'm very, very happy with AEW and the way that I'm treated. So the idea that Wardlow would go to WWE seems unlikely. Now, I don't know when his contract is up. You know, MJF has talked, they've even talked about it on TV. His contract still has two years left. I don't know if Wardlow has a year, two years, three years. That I don't know. And I don't think he's publicly said. Things can change. Happy now, not so happy a year from now. There were people who probably came over from WWE who came to AEW. Happy to be gone from there. 
looking for an opportunity, so happy to be in AEW. It's like getting out of Shawshank, who now may not be so happy because they have such a big roster that not everybody is getting equal time on television. So I'm sure there are some very unhappy and frustrated people. I mean, Big Swole sort of alluded to that, uh, you know, recently. But for now, Wardlow seems very happy. He seems intent to be a lifer in that company. He's got no reason to leave. He has no reason to leave. You're trading one billionaire for another. I think they'll take care of Wardlow. I don't think they're going to shortchange the guy. I think he'll make good money, and I think they'll give him the best chance to grow into a big star and not, you know, sort of get uh, lost in the shuffle. Or they get bored of him and they move on to somebody else, like has happened to so many other people. So the idea that he would leave and go to WWE, I'm sure WWE would love it, but that ain't going to happen. Lance Archer is back. He attacked Hangman Adam Page, left him laying, which I th- I'm i going to say sets up for a title match at Beach Break. I-, I think that, you know, Revolution is still a ways away. I don't know that Archer is the strongest challenger they could come up with for a pay-per-view match or a pay-per-view main event. Uh, I even made the comment on Wednesday. I said if their intent is to go to Revolution with that as the championship match, I don't think you close out the show with that. If they were going to do Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa, I think that would be a stronger match to close out a revolution with, maybe in a cage. But they got their big beach break show coming up in Cleveland in a couple of weeks, and I can see that being the title match, or at least the first match, uh, being set up for that show. Archer's been out since October. He landed on his head uh, in his match with uh, Eddie Kingston, and so it's good to see him back and healthy again. Brody King finally showed up to aid Malachi Black. Uh, He signed pretty much right after Ring of Honor announced that they were going to be going dark for a few months. So I I assume that means his deal was probably inked back in November and they kept it quiet, even though people were kind of murmuring about it. And they kept him off television until this week. He and Malachi Black are the tag team champions in PWG. They're very familiar with each other. Uh, I I think it'd be great to add them to the tag team division, but I don't want that to happen at the expense of Malachi doing singles matches. I'd like to see him doing both. But Brody King is the second Ring of Honor pickup after Jay Lethal. Uh, We still don't know if the Briscoes are going to be coming in. Tony Khan made a comment this week sort sort of saying that, well, you know, we have a lot of people already. They're a really talented team, but, you know, making it sound like there's no room for the Briscoes, I don't buy that for a second. I think he's uh, throwing us off the scent, and it's only a matter of time before they come in and work a match or a a whole program with FTR. Now, Dynamite this Wednesday has Adam Cole and Britt Baker as partners for the first time in AEW against Orange Cassidy and Chris Statlander. CM Punk is facing Sean Spears at the request of MJF. Serena Deeb takes on Sky Blue. Sting and Darby Allin take on the acclaimed. And the TNT champion. Cody Rhodes, out of quarantine, back on Dynamite this week. I'm so glad we have an interim champion. After Cody missed, what, uh, seven days, ten days? And I'm wondering if we might also see Jon Moxley. I was surprised to not see him on the show this week. Uh, He clearly is ready to come back. This is their last chance on Wednesday before the GCW pay-per-view next Sunday because Moxley is going to be on that show. And so if they want him back on AEW first get that big first time pop back, it's it's now or never. You know, they either do it this week or GCW gets him first. Moxley is going to be defending his GCW world title next Sunday against Homicide. It's going to be their first match in more than a decade since 2011. They wrestled at a Dragon Gate USA show. It will be the world on GCW from the Hammerstein Ballroom, sold out in New York City. The biggest event in GCW history, not only airing on Fight TV, but on traditional pay-per-view as well. And the full card has Moxley against Homicide, Ring of Honor World Champion Jonathan Gresham against Blake Christian, Matt Cardona with Chelsea Green taking on Joey Janela. All three of them have been doing their own takeoff of the old Randy Savage, Ric Flair angle in WWE with Miss Elizabeth. She was mine before she was yours. Ruby Soho takes on Ali Catch. Eddie Kingston takes on AJ Gray. We've got Team Bandito against Team Gringo. And Jeff Jarrett takes on Effie. You know, they brought in Jeff Jarrett on one of their last shows. 
They just had Kevin Nash make an appearance at their most notorious show on Friday night. They were in Nash's hometown of Detroit, so they invited him to come do a promo, and he introduced his former paparazzi production stablemate from TNA, Alex Shelley. You know, if they're not careful, they may turn into TNA here. But the uh, the night before, they're hosting their first annual Indie Wrestling Hall of Fame induction ceremony at The Cutting Room in New York City. They're streaming it live and free on their YouTube channel. Lefisto is being inducted by Lenny Leonard. Jerry Lynn is being inducted by Sean Waltman. Homicide is being inducted. Also, Ruckus and Tracy Smothers. And Dave Prezak will be inducted by none other than CM Punk. That's Saturday night, and the pay-per-view next Sunday airs at 8 p.m. I am planning at this point on watching the show and going live on YouTube when it is over for the review. So you will probably get a GCW Hammerstein recap on YouTube next Sunday night. I'll keep you guys posted.